So you might be thinking, if you took a look at my CV, you would think, now there's an ambitious and driven woman. There's someone who is an accomplished researcher in cardiovascular exercise physiology and spinal cord injury and in aging. There's someone who is a mentor and supervisor to over 20 undergraduate and graduate students in her research lab. And perhaps most importantly, there's a mother and Uber driver to three boys. Four, if you count my husband. But if you had a look at my CV, there's one thing that you would not see on there. You would not see the title medical doctor. That's despite the fact that I went to medical school for one year. Because when I was at medical school, I hit the pause button. I stopped and paused my ambition, the ambition that had allowed me to get to medical school. It was because I wasn't sure that ambition was going to carry me through in medical school, and if it did, whether it would be a good thing. Now, you might be wondering why I hit that pause button. The truth behind that is that in medical school, I was miserable. And anyone who knows me knows that I'm an optimist. It's my default setting. And, and what you'll see is that in combination with that optimist, I'm a functioning introvert. So we're hoping today, standing in front of you, that the optimism is going to win out over the introversion. But in medical school, you wouldn't have seen that I was optimistic. You would have, if you were around me, been e easily been able to see that I was miserable. And I was trying to figure out why and what to do. I did what most of you likely do when you're faced with a challenge like that. I started to talk to the people around me and ask them for advice. First, I went to my classmates and my peers. I asked them what they thought I should do. Then I summoned up the courage and I talked to some of my professors and my instructors. Universally, I heard the exact same response. And I'm sure you can guess what that was. It was, stay the course, stick with it. Your ambition got you here. It's really tough to get into medical school. Don't quit now. What I also heard in there was that someone thought you were good enough to be a medical doctor and you should use your ambition to drive you forward. Once you do that, you will achieve success, and with success will come happiness, and then you will be optimistic again and no longer miserable. Something about that advice, although it was universal, wasn't really resonating with me, and I decided to seek another opinion. That was the opinion of my family. This is a photo of my family, uh, part of my family, my mom in her kitchen in that same year, 1993. She's with my grandparents and my sister, and if my mom found out this was the only picture I could find of her that year, and she was dressed like this, she would be horrified. But I want you to picture what I did. I thought I could go home to Truro, Nova Scotia, walk through that front door and sit at that kitchen table, receive some tea and some cookies and get a, some hugs and pats on the back and consistent advice to everything else I had heard. I thought I would hear everything you've heard is correct. Stay the course, stick with it. Instead, I got exactly what I needed, which was a healthy dose of maritime or tough love. What my mother said to me was, Oh, Maureen, why are you asking all those people what you should do? Don't you know you're not actually that important to them? I was a little bit horrified. <laughs> she said, do you really think all those people are going home today, sitting around their kitchen tables and talking about what Maureen McDonald should do with the rest of her life? She said, no. Of course they gave you an opinion. The problem is they don't actually have any stake in the outcome. She said, when you have an important decision like this, what should you do with the rest of your life? What you should do is make sure you're asking only one person. At this, I was a little bit trembling and paused and hoping maybe she was that person. She continued on to say, that person is you. You're the only one who can know what you should do with the rest of your life. She went on to say, pretty toughly, even your father and I don't care what you do. <laughs> she said, the only thing we care about is that you're actually happy and doing something that you love. That was a light bulb moment for me. 
I realized I'd been so busy asking so many people for an opinion on a really important question that I had actually forgotten to ask about myself and ask that of myself. And I realized when I was quiet enough to actually think about it, I knew immediately what was in my heart and in my head. What was in that space was a clear answer that it was time to say goodbye to medical school. And I think it's a wonderful profession, and I know that many people uh, pursue that pr profession and are very happy and optimistic about their life in that profession. But when I really thought about it, I realized particularly the case studies we were doing filled me with dread and sadness thinking about those patients and their families. When I was quiet enough to think about what I really wanted, I realized there was a parallel career sitting right beside me. That parallel career still was the science of health, but it was health and physical activity. It was the science of achieving and maintaining health through physical activity and exercise. And that allowed me to pack up my bags, leave medical school, and go to the University of Waterloo. In Waterloo, I pursued my PhD in kinesiology, and then I, I went to the University of British Columbia and the University of Western Ontario to do postdocs, and then to Wilfrid Laurier University, where I got my first faculty job. But 19 years ago, I came to McMaster, and in McMaster, I found the true place where I can have my passion and my optimism leveraged towards my interest in science. And I'm surrounded every day with colleagues and students and partners who are just as passionate about finding a brighter world through science as I am. The key test, though, is what would I do if now, as the Dean of Science, I was faced with that same situation I put others in 26 years ago? What if a student came up to me and she said, I'm miserable. I'm not sure if this is what I should be doing. What should I do? What I would try to do is make sure that I paused and I channeled a little bit of my mom, but maybe dialed down the tough love a little bit. I would want to say to that student, while I can give you an opinion, it's not actually me you should be listening to because I don't have a real stake in the outcome. You need to pause and think about what you really want. And I know I think it's even harder for young people today because they're constantly bombarded by the noise and the advice, most of it really well-meaning. But I don't think the question of what should I do with my life is one that you can crowdsource. I don't think it's one that you can ask an audience, either from a stage or from social media. And I think it's one where you need to pause and look inside for the real answer to that question. I would also want to tell the student that it is okay, however, to ask for help. And it's okay to look around you for people who can help you work through those big questions of life. But that I've found one thing. If I'm facing a really big decision, I tend to bring the circle of people involved in that decision smaller and smaller. And in a nod to my colleagues in physics and astronomy, I'd say if you're faced with a Saturn-sized question or problem, you probably want to look to a Mercury-sized collection of people for that answer. In that collection of people, I think there's a few things that they need to have in common in their characteristics. One, they have to know you really well, and hopefully in knowing you that well, have a real stake in the outcome to the question you're putting to them. Second, I think that you have to give them the space to be really honest and hold that mirror up, tell you when you're miserable, and help to hold you accountable to those decisions. I've found when you do that, those people will come behind you. And after any decision, whether it's a big or a small course correction or a major shift in the direction of your life, they will then be there and behind you, helping you move forward with that decision. I think now more than ever, what the world needs is ambitious optimists. We need ambitiously optimistic scientists, artists, teachers, lawyers, doctors, nurses, educators, students, and deans. We need to fill our campuses with ambitiously optimistic students. We need to fill our communities with ambitiously optimistic citizens. And in doing that, we need to think carefully about what the world will look like in the future. 
My parents never told me what to do with my life, but they gave me a key piece of advice about how to live it. And that piece of advice was to not leverage your ambition towards being better than everyone else around you, but it was to leverage that ambition to actually making yourself better every day. And when we do that, we're going to achieve incredible outcomes together. So I think if you find yourself running in a race, that it feels like you're miserable and you're wondering if you are in the wrong race, you might be. What you should do is hit the pause button. Let your ambition jog in place. I would suggest that in this very noisy world, you have to get quiet. You have to look sideways, look up, and especially look inside to yourselves. And when you look inside, search for that awesome, ambitious optimist that will tell you what you should do. Thank you.